Thank you Good very evening, much. Professor Dawkins. Uh, my name is Thomas Lukowski. I come from uh, Thomas Jefferson's University, here to ask you a question. Richard, atheists have a PR problem. They are among the most distrusted minorities in the U.S. Many, pe many people equate atheism with immorality and pessimism. They ask, what good has atheism done? Atheism is so cold, I don't find any comfort from those who do not believe in God. Some have attempted to answer these criticisms with new life stances, such as humanism or the church of reality. They assert there will, be, there will not be widespread apostasy until there is a replacement for religion. Sam Harris says, we must find ways of meeting our emotional needs that do not require the abject embrace of the, of the preposterous. Further, he says, we must learn to invoke the power of ritual and to mark those transitions in every human life that demand profundity, birth, marriage, death, without lying to ourselves about the nature of reality. So my question is, do you, what is your view of that assertion that there will not be widespread apostasy until we find a replacement for religion? Yes, thank you. That's an extremely interesting question. Um, a very important one. If it is the case that people find consolation and comfort in religion, then I'm not in the least surprised, but note that that doesn't in any way imply that religious beliefs are true. What is comforting and what is true are two entirely different things. It's important to get that out of the way first, because there are people, I'm sorry to say, who can't tell the difference between that which is comforting and that which is true. Um, if you don't see the point, uh, imagine a doctor telling you you're absolutely fine when actually you've got terminal cancer. There are people who would wish their doctor to lie to them, um, but um, th those people who would not wish their doctor to lie to them should not be sympathetic to the idea that um, that, re that religion has value simply because it is comforting or consoling. Now, the questioner quotes Sam Harris, as, by the way, I strongly recommend his books, um, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, both utterly brilliant books. Sam Harris um, says we need to replace the uh, various roles of religion. Uh, comfort might be one of them. Ritual might be another, uh, rites of passage, uh, marriages, funerals, and so on might be another. To the extent that humans do need ritual and do need uh, public meetings to signal things like births, marriages, and deaths, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't put on secular equivalents of the religious ceremonies that mostly dominate our, our um, lives at the moment. Uh, I have myself organized one secular funeral for a very dearly loved colleague and been to many others. Uh, and um, what, what we did and what is normally done is to obviously dispense with all prayers, but you retain music, you retain poetry, you can have um, readings from the deceased person's favorite books, eulogies by people who knew and loved the deceased person. This is not difficult to arrange. It has the smack of sincerity about it in a way that prayers, which are for all the same prayers for everybody, regardless of who they are, um, the smack of sincerity comes from the fact that they're individually tailored to the individual who's died. Whenever I've been to religious funerals, which have an element of the non-religious about them, religious funerals which include eulogies, which include the deceased's favorite poetry, etc. I don't know about you, but my experience is that the prayers fall absolutely flat, whereas the eulogies and the poems are intensely moving. My wife even says, thank goodness for the prayers. They are the one thing that stops her from crying and, and keeps her... Um, <laughs> amused almost rather than 
rather than being sad about the, the loss of the much-loved dead person. The questioner is absolutely right in his preamble when he says that at least in American society, atheists are um, the least loved, least um, respected major group. That's something that's got to change because atheists are far, far more numerous than most people realize. And that's mostly because they won't come out of the closet. <laughs> it's obvious that in an intelligent, educated audience such as this university, I stress this university since... <laughs> Saw, who was it saw fit to give them accreditation, I'd like to know. <laughs> In a place like this, I have not the slightest doubt that there are a very large number of atheists and agnostics. What is wrong with everybody in that position throughout the country, standing up, recognizing each other, joining together and forming, I won't say a lobby, because somebody suggested that organizing atheists is rather like herding cats. <laughs> they are, on the whole, too intelligent and independent-minded to lend themselves to being herded. But if, a, if an atheist lobby could be got together, which showed a small fraction of its numerical strength, it would outnumber, for example, the Jewish lobby, which is formidably and notoriously powerful in this country. There are more secularists, agnostics and atheists in this country than there are Jews. But do they have a voice in politics? Is it possible for an atheist to get elected to high office in this country? No. The Congress of this country is presumably, at least partly, derived from the intelligent, educated wing of the country. That being so, it is statistically almost inconceivable that a substantial number of members of Congress are not atheists. Obviously, many of them must be. And yet, not a single one of them will admit it. They are forced to dissemble, even to lie, about their religious convictions, because that's the only way they can get elected. Well, isn't that something that the American electorate ought to be doing something about? So I accept the questioner's premise and suggest that it's up to, well, I'm not an American citizen, so it's unfortunately not up to me, but <laughs> up to all of you to do something about it and to change the status of atheists in this country and to change the electability of atheists in this the country. Of, of social justice in the, in the, in the, in the rights of, of, of atheists to be considered citizens and to be considered electable. I don't think the issue is, is quite that they should be elected because they are atheists. That wasn't the point. The point is that being an atheist should not debar you any more than being black, to go back in history to being black or Jewish or Catholic or a woman or any of the other things which historically have tended to make somebody unelectable, and no longer do, I'm delighted to say, um, that, that, that atheists and indeed homosexuals, um, which, are, which, are, which are the next one most difficult lot to get elected, um, <laughs> but atheists are the, are the, sort of, are, are the last major group um, to be embraced in, in, in this um, um, charmed circle of the electable. Um, I'm not saying they should be elected because they're atheists. I'm, I'm saying that, that, that they should be free to openly say what their religious conviction or lack of conviction is and not thereby instantly be unelectable. That, that's, all I, that, that's all I meant. I didn't mean anything more than that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>